guys, it's Eric, owner of Farpoint Farms here in the mountains of North Carolina, and it's time for part two. I'm in the same outfit, I'm in the same spot, it's because I'm filming these all at the same time. Part two, we're talking about emergency communications, what you should maybe consider having in your stash, and why. In part one, we discussed all the reasons why I personally got into it, my own personal story of a catastrophe, and, uh, and how CB radio saved the day, and I have no doubt it would do the same if the same thing happened right now, right here in 2020. Look at this pile of electronics I have here and be not amazed. It's really taken me many, many years to collect all this stuff. But if you shop uh, smart, you can get this stuff relatively inexpensive. So I'm going to start with CB radio and why I think out of all the equipment that you see here, and there's more that I'm going to be sharing with you here in a second, this is the most important piece of equipment you can have. CB radio and most disasters are going to be localized. A disaster like a tornado touchdown is going to affect an area that CB radio is generally capable of communicating from one end to the other of, unless it's like an F5 and it just keeps on rolling. But hurricanes, yeah, a hurricane is gonna wipe out maybe the whole eastern seaboard, but your problem is going to be local. Uh, same thing with a tornado, same thing with wildfire, same thing with whatever. Your problem is going to be a local problem, and CB is a local way of communicating and finding answers to your problems. That's why I'm going to recommend CB. This is a sideband CB radio, and I bought this uh, refurbished or slightly used. It cost about $119 when I picked it up. You can get used sideband CB radios at flea markets for considerably less than that. Expect to pay probably $50 for a good working sideband CB. You don't need to have a CB that's sideband. This here is a Radio Shack. I'm not even sure what model it is. TRC413. This is a $5 pickup. Came with a microphone. Has the power cord and a fuse attached to it. Does have uh, external speaker and, um, and, and PA functions, but those are not important. What is important to know is that that is the equivalent of what I had in my car uh, when I went through my catastrophe. That is an AM 40 channel radio. I'm going to say 75 to 90 percent of AM traffic you will find on the airwaves today are AM only. In the event of an emergency and people start pulling out those old radios from their garage or from underneath the bed or wherever, the attic, chances are those are going to be AM rigs as well. So AM is fine for the case of trying to put together maybe a little survival radio gear set, okay? So go ahead and get yourself a $5 radio and you will be started on your path to keeping in touch during a catastrophe. These radios are best when hooked to a massive base station antenna like the Antron A99, the Max 2000, and there's a variety of other ones that are base antennas. But if you remember in part one, my personal catastrophe, hey, it was a car radio hooked to a car. I did have a 102 whip, which is a good radio antenna to have, but really any antenna would have worked good enough for that particular condition. So if you have the ability to hook one in your car, you're golden if you have one that you can set up in there because you're going to have your power supply, you're going to have a means of recharging that power supply if you need to, and you're going to have an antenna already mounted and ready to go. So as long as your vehicle is good, you're good. So there is like phase one, step one of communications in an emergency. You also can go to your car, turn on the old AM, FM radio, and hear hopefully local news, although FM is pretty much gone National, there's really hardly any local stations left nationwide. Very few, I would say. AM still has some local, but a lot of times they're also broadcasting national news. However, in the event of a local emergency, they preempt that stuff most times. And, and even though they don't really have newsrooms in most local AM stations anymore, they have the ability to get news to you. So uh, I, I still trust that as a great way of getting your information. So there you go. There's your easy comms. Let's move up. What other kinds of ways do you want to be able to get in touch with people or just listen, right? AM, FM is great, but all right, so let's say that uh, you've got the CB radio and your AM, FM radio in your car and you're golden. What other kinds of local types of communication equipment would you want to have? And there's two that I can think of. I'm going to show you them right now. The first one is this. I've got it kind of bundled up. I had it hooked up inside the house, but I brought it out here for this video. And that is this. This is a Radio Shack scanner. Uh, this is an older one. I don't even know what model this is. I don't have my glasses on, but it, it's a, it's not old, old, but it's analog. And a lot of um, radio systems have gone digital, so you may want to look at getting something that offers digital capabilities. But what, why do you want this? Because you want to be able to hear emergency services. If, if, uh, if there's something going on on the street or in the neighborhood or in the town or in the community, 
a toxic gas, uh, you know, an earthquake. I don't know what. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. You could rupture a main gas line and may not know that your neighborhood has a serious issue. Something like a scanner is going to allow you access to it. And you're wondering how to power it. I'll get to it. But for right now, this is just something that I would say would be something I would want to have. If I were to go through Hurricane Fran again, I would have wanted something like this to listen to so I can know what's going on, where the emergencies are, and what I can do to, to get out of that trouble. Lastly, for local communications, I'm going to go with these two items here. This is a GMRS radio. This is actually a pretty stout one from Midland. This is a FRS little walkie-talkie handheld. This one happens to be from Cobra, but you can get them from a lot of different brands. This is just a great way to communicate inside of a neighborhood. If you're going to use walkie-talkies, I don't even know if I recommend CB walkie-talkies um, for a catastrophe because this thing's going to run on double A's or triple A's, and uh, and it's got the range for neighborhood. And and so I would consider this the neighborhood communication device. A lot of people do have these sitting in the drawers before cell phones became. Uh, you know, in everyone's pocket. Uh, these were quite popular for families to give to kids when they would go to the beach or go to, uh, you know, the park or whatever so they could communicate. So FRS radio, GMRS here, this base station, this is, this is almost like intermediate. This moves on to the next stage. And this talks, uh, this is a way to move into being able to communicate even farther distances than this. If you had two 40 watt GMRS setups with base antennas, you're probably talking uh, you know, good good range here, so you might be able to communicate with um, parties farther away. There's only one thing you need to keep in mind when you look at these two. This one is superior technology, but it has less of a reach in the population. So everybody, or a lot of people, I won't say everybody, but a lot of people have a radio like this stashed away somewhere. Most people have an old CB laying around somewhere. Very few people have GMRS technology laying around because it's relatively new. So even though it's superior, we're still kind of waiting for GMRS to catch up and that's something important to keep in mind. So that's just for you to keep in mind there. Next up I want to talk about, it would be long range communications. I, I don't have a picture of one, but uh, here, well, I do have a picture of one. I don't have one here because I currently don't have any all band or, or HF band ham radios, but ham radio is a way of talking globally uh, in the event of a, a catastrophe, a global catastrophe. I still feel that most of the issues that humans run into during a catastrophe, even if it was global, are going to be local. I don't really care what's going on in Czechoslovakia if I don't have water right here. And I think that that's something that we kind of need to keep in mind when we talk about some of these other ways. That's not to say these aren't important. So. A ham radio, a really nice ham radio that does all bands uh, or all ham bands <coughs> is something you may want to consider. I've had my eye on this ICOM 7300 for a while, but be aware that both like this Midland GMRS, uh, this requires a license, a family license. The, uh, the ham radio does require licensing, and so that's another step you'd have to go through. That being said, if you moved into ham, you would have the ability to communicate and get information back and forth across countries, across states, across the world. And that can be a real asset. In fact, there have been many times where ham radio operators have stepped up to the plate to transfer information across the world. Back in my day, uh, they did it for guys who were deployed overseas, which was kind of nice. But I don't know if that's still something that happens, to be honest with you, with all the technological advances that uh, phone systems have made. Lastly, and this is something that I would get into just because it's relatively inexpensive, um, but it also allows you to at least listen to the world and hear things around the world, is something like this or something even like that. This is a DX100. This is a shortwave receiver or general all-band receiver, general coverage receiver. This allows you to pick up on the shortwave bands and on the midwave bands pretty much anything is going on. So while again most problems are local, this would allow you to listen to the voice of Russia, the voice of China, the, the voice of North Korea if you're interested in it, and, and listen to what's going on there. So if there was a huge catastrophe, say a, an asteroid impact or a meteorite impact of massive magnitude that wiped out a good portion of, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm sorry to do this to you Australia, but let's say Australia got wiped out um, and it, it was, you know, devastating. You may not get all the information you need about what's coming. Are we having a global climate change crisis? Are we having, 
you know, some kind of fallout here, or we, is this was there radioactivity in the cloud? I mean, there's a lot of things you might want to listen to about something that happened on the other side of the world that your local reporting might not really get into. They might, I wouldn't say they won't be telling you the truth, but they might mold the truth, kind of curve it around and make it into something they want to tell you as opposed to what's really going on. So that's a reason you would want to get this. This I picked up at a yard sale or at a ham fest for I think $20. But this right here, if you keep your eyes out, and it's missing a little screen, it fell off here, I need to re-glue it. Not screen, but just mesh here. This is a little pocket one, it runs off of two double A's. It's actually a world band radio, it picks up seven bands, and it actually works extremely well off of just two double A batteries, and almost as good as this, you know, antenna-wise. So it's, it's something you could get, and if you keep your eye out, most of these things, most people think, ah, oh, it's just in the little AM radio. It's a world band, so if you keep your eye out, you can pick these things up used for a buck or two at Goodwill. If you want to pick up one new, I think they're like $15 on, on eBay or Amazon. And of course, they come under about a thousand different name brands, but there's something for you to think about. And, uh, and, and that pretty much wraps up this part, this, the communication part one. The question I'm sure all of you are asking is, what good is any of this stuff if the power's out? And that will be in part three, which I'm also going to film today, because again, I just want to break this up. It just felt like too much to talk about in one sit-down setting. But in part three, we'll talk about power and how we go around powering equipment like this. This one and this one are 12 volts, so uh, that makes it easy. This one is not, and that makes it a little more difficult. The scanner's not, and there's other equipment out there that's not. So I'll show you, I'll walk you through it. It's not it's not impossible to do. In fact, it's kind of something you ought to have anyway because there's other purposes outside of this that you could or should have a setup like this. Until next time, I will see you later. Take care.